Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, a chartered engineer, member of the Royal Aeronautical Society. I worked in the space industry for 30 years um, with what is now Airbus, uh, Defence and Space, and went through all sorts of names before that. And the last 10 years of my career was spent uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope. Can you confirm this is the slide has moved on? Yes, it yes has. I can confirm. OK, so I want to give you a bit of historical context to sort of set the scene. And the first thing uh, is to note that the orbital space age began 4th of October 1957 with the launch of Sputnik 1 by what was then the USSR. This was a pretty momentous event in world history, and it's not an understatement to say this caused enormous panic in America. Um, it's also a sad fact to reflect on that I was running around in short trousers when that happened. So the entire history of orbital space flight has happened in my lifetime. Gives you some idea of how old I am. Last year uh, marked 60 years since the first human went into space making an orbit of the Earth on the 12th of April 1961. And leaping forward, the Hubble Space Telescope that I'm sure everyone knows about was launched on the 24th of April 1990. And it is not an understatement to say that this revolutionised our view of the universe. Hubble really changed everything. Now, if all keeps going to plan, the James Webb Space Telescope or JWST or just Webb, it should be commissioned very soon, a matter of weeks. And the claim is this will be an event for astronomy that is likely to be even more momentous and revolutionary than those three points I mentioned uh, to start with. So this talk provides an overview of how James Webb came to be, why it looks the way it does, and give a preview of what is to come. Now it's been successfully launched and is on the verge of science operations. Bit of the background, the origins go back to the mid 1990s when the next generation of space telescope after Hubble was being formulated. Some of the scientists and engineers working on, on web go back that far. This is more than half a career. Uh, in lifetime. Now, a lot of you will be aware that if you look far into space, you are also looking far back in time. And the goal of the next generation space telescope was to look back to the very first stars and galaxies that lit up sometime after the so-called Big Bang, the, the beginning. And this is something which Hubble is simply not able to do. I'll come back to that later. Uh, just, just physical um, optics tell you you can't do it with Hubble. You do need different capabilities. And this new space telescope was the top priority of the US National Academy of Sciences in their decadal uh, report in, in 2001. The UK has a key role in leading a multinational group that provides one of the four instruments on James Webb. The lead scientist or principal investigator, or PI as they're called, is based at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh and my part in this was I was the project manager for this UK led instrument for the 10 years leading up to delivery to NASA in 2012. That is not a typo. Uh, the European consortium that, that put all this together actually delivered the hardware to NASA uh, 10 years, in fact it's over 10 years ago. Um, I was based at Airbus and Stevenage, but effectively we had a small team operating independently to manage the European consortium to design, build and test the instrument. And a very significant part of the instrument is the imager, which comes from France. It was led by uh, CEA, or perhaps I should say, say uh, ah, I think, um, uh, who basically uh, designed and built the uh, imager. Uh, it has various bits inside it from other European countries, but the imager was led, led by France. I'm going to show you a very short video. It's only a few minutes long. Most of this talk, there's a lot of, lot of images, 
or videos. You can get all of these off any of the James Webb websites, whether it's the NASA one, the ESA one, the European Space Agency, or national websites, Kines will have one. They're all interlinked anyway. But what you won't find is this video anymore. It's been withdrawn, but I like it because I think it's one of the best uh, just to give you a flavour and a feel for the whole thing. Um, it does say the launch date is 2018. As I said, it's a very old video and um, it does have a temperature, a cold temperature in a very large uh, degrees F negative number, which won't mean anything to anybody, but it was made for an American audience. Um, so I'm just going to let this play and um, uh, Hugh, if you could just confirm it has actually started playing. Yes, that's nothing. James Webb is the chap in the middle. It's Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist on the right. OK, uh, can I just check you're still with me? Indeed. Thanks, John. OK, and that did that video play OK? Yes, it uh, the sound wasn't uh, wasn't the main feature, but the visuals were fine. OK, um, so uh, why is the observatory named James Webb? And in fact, who is James Webb? You need to go back in history. Uh, and back in 1961, NASA was a new agency with a very modest stature in the government. And there was a general view at that time that um, be because this was a few years after Sputnik had been launched uh, and it was all regarded as Buck Rogers nonsense. Buck Rogers was the comic book hero of the era. And the Americans were working on a plan uh, to put a, a single American astronaut into orbit. Um, and this was the Mercury program. And everybody thought this would quiet down. But beginning of 1961, there was a new administration, a new president, the young John F. Kennedy. And new president, new administration brings in new heads of all the government agencies. And most people turned down the request to become the new chief of NASA. 
not only because it was it was not a great big agency, but primarily the vice president was Lyndon B. Johnson, who was, to put it mildly, a very nasty piece of work. And he was in charge of the Space Council and nobody wanted to work with him. Eventually, um, Jim Webb, the uh, he was known as Jim, uh, a lawyer uh, was persuaded by Kennedy to become the second so-called master administrator. And um, he went on to become, many would argue, the greatest in NASA's 63 year old, 63 year history. But significantly, he'd been an undersecretary of state. He knew how Washington worked. And he became the NASA chief in, a, in a, uh, government circles. That's called the administrator. That's not the person that does the filing. That is the boss man in February 1961. Here's uh, Kennedy on the left and Jim Webb uh, on the right. And two months after Jim Webb took over NASA, this happened. The picture is Yuri Gagarin. This is a newspaper. Uh, it's the Huntsville Times. Huntsville, Alabama is where Werner von Braun and a lot of the captured German rocket scientists from World War Two were developing big rockets and that went on to develop the, um, the Saturn V moon rocket. Uh, and to put it bluntly, Gagarin led to Apollo, missing out a lot of history. There was a widely held view that it was in fact Werner von Braun who drove Apollo um, to get to the moon. In fact, much more than anyone else, it was Jim Webb who ensured that America eventually won the space race by landing two men on the moon in 1969. Now, in fact, Webb left NASA a year before. There was a bit of a show trial and uh, circumstances in those days were significantly different to, to today's uh, atmospheres. Um, and uh, he definitely left under a cloud, but his reputation has basically been restored. But Webb found himself in charge of the largest, the costliest and the most ambitious engineering project in human history just three months after taking over at, at NASA. And Webb steered the expansion of NASA from this minor collection of research laboratories into one of the grandest enterprises the world has ever seen. A legend and a legacy that he was pivotal, pivotal in creating and the NASA PR machine is, is something quite phenomenal, so I'm sure most people are aware. But although he was the driving force behind Apollo, he wasn't just focused on the moon. He sincerely believed it was important to do space science as a parallel activity. And he, he basically not these these separate uh, what they call field centers scattered around the states, not them into a co cohesive organization. The politics went through him and that's why he ended up uh, in, in the end getting blamed for all sorts of things. But in the early days, Webb saved the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, JPL, from being axed by Congress. Uh, they'd had significant number of failures because they carried on with the World War II approach of developing rocket boosters, uh, which is essentially it's fail fast, fail often. But if money is no object, it's a brilliant way to develop new uh, technologies. Unfortunately, when you start failing fast and failing often with expensive spacecraft, the price goes up enormously. But there are interesting parallels with Elon Musk and SpaceX and their philosophy, which you could describe as fail fast, fail often. Uh, and if you're a billionaire, you can afford to do it. But he also clashed with the director of the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is where Hubble was primed from. Um, and, and because Goddard, the Goddard Space Flight Center is on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., they were particularly anti having a, head, a separate headquarters downtown. Um, however, even though there were clashes, he very much supported their scientific work. And he took an early interest in what became the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's not surprising the project to follow Hubble is named the James Webb Space Telescope. Very unusual science projects and observatories are usually named after astronomers or scientists. So naming one 
after a bureaucrat is very odd. If you were cynical, you might say that they thought if they named this, what they knew was going to be a very expensive project after a bureaucrat, then Congress might be less inclined to cancel it. But that would be a bit cynical. Anyway, we can't go without a picture of Hubble. As I said, Hubble revolutionized astronomy. But there are two things in this picture I'd like you to um, uh, note. One is Hubble looks like a telescope. It's a tube. Everybody knows a telescope is a tube. The main mirror, it's a, this is a Newtonian type telescope, a reflecting telescope, is at the right hand side of this image at the, at the bottom. And light comes in through the dustbin lid that, that, that's now open uh, on the left hand side. The other thing to notice is that is the Earth below it. Hubble's orbiting about 570 kilometers up. Those are clouds. You can see the curvature of the Earth. Uh, but the point is, it is very, very close to the Earth. And I'll come back to that. Uh, this is just to give an idea of what happened in the roughly 400 year history of the telescope. Uh, the vertical scale is a log scale orders of magnitude of improvement over the human eye. And uh, without going through all the details, as telescopes and instruments developed, photography came along, charge couple devices, and then Hubble, enormous improvements in what we could detect and uh, extract data from were made. And James Webb is pushing that at least another order of magnitude. So the key points are that, that Webb is the scientific successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It's not its replacement. It is looking in a different bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a joint mission. When it started, the division was roughly 80 percent funded by NASA. 15% by the European Space Agency or ESA and the Canadian Space Agency, 5%. Um, that ratio has changed over the intervening years, but essentially this is the basis on which time is allocated between the different scientists and nations. It is an observatory optimized for infrared. And for those into these things, we're talking about 0.6 to 28 microns. Visible light is, is in basically 0.4 to 0.7 microns. And you need to be in the infrared to be able to study the origin and evolution of galaxies, stars and planetary systems. The primary mirror and its primary mirror size that defines a telescope is six and a half meters across. And it had to fall to fit inside the Ariane 5 rocket that launched it. And that was part of the European contribution to provide the rocket. Uh, Webb uh, operates way outside Earth orbit, unlike Hubble. In fact, it's in orbit around the sun, tracking around the sun at the same rate as the Earth. And the telescope and most of the instruments operate at what we call cryogenic temperatures. So we're down at 40 Kelvin, 40 degrees above absolute zero or minus 233 Celsius. And you need to be that cold to get the infrared performance to get the science you want. Um, one big feature of Webb is the lead scientist is the only NASA Nobel laureate. And John Mather is the guy on the right. He's a real gentleman. Um, he got the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2006 with George Smoot, the guy in the middle, uh, for their basically mapping the cosmic microwave background, which was the point at which um, the Big Bang theory basically became uh, established and the idea of a steady state universe went away. There are four key science goals for James Webb. These are basically first light and reionization, assembly of galaxies, birth of stars and protoplanetary systems and planetary systems themselves and the origin of life. Now, there's a lot of information about that. I'm just going to focus on the first one because this is one of the, the primary driving goals uh, of why I want to get right back uh, as far as we, we can see. So first light and reionization. The goal is to identify the very first luminous sources to form after the Big Bang 
and to determine the early ionization history of the universe, which is still something of a mystery. The Big Bang, just to digress, the term Big Bang was actually coined as a derogatory term for the people who believed in a beginning theory, um, uh, but it stuck. Uh, it, it's, it's a terrible description um, because it wasn't a bang in an empty room, as a lot of people seem to think. It's a, it was the beginning of everything, time and space. And immediately after this, there were, uh, basically it was a flux of ionized particles, uh, a, a thick quantum soup, if you like. The universe was opaque, but as the universe expanded and cooled, eventually quarks formed into protons. Um, protons and electrons combined to form hydrogen atoms and the opaque universe became transparent. That is the origin of the cosmic microwave background round about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. But the universe was dark, there were no stars. And the time until the first stars were born is still not certain to within several hundred billion years and, until recently. And even now, we're not sure if it was maybe 250 million or 350 million years after the Big Bang when the first stars lit up. And even that might be wrong. And the term first light describes the appearance of the very first stars or superstar clusters. Now, these were hydrogen, pure hydrogen stars. They would have burned incredibly hot and incredibly fast in stellar terms. Uh, they would have radiated intensely um, and reionized the surrounding gases and, and dust and so on. And that's why it's called the epoch of reionization. Uh, and this whole area, we can't probe it at the moment. In a more poetic sense, first light marked the end of the cosmic dark ages with the arrival of the cosmic dawn. And this is a picture, this is the entire history of the universe, 13.7 or maybe it's 13.8 billion years. Uh, it's diagrammatic. Um, it's basically trying to show the expansion history. If we start on the left, quantum fluctuations in the Big Bang, there was an incredibly rapid expansion of the universe. And then uh, we, we got to this point where it became transparent. Now, when this slide was written, it was written as 400,000 years, 380,000 years, it's close enough. But then we had the dark ages and the first stars, again, when this slide was made, thought to be about 400 million years after the Big Bang. That is possibly, uh, it's possibly much shorter than that, we now think. But essentially the expansion of the universe slowed down and there are a lot of theories that it may eventually collapse, uh, sorry, uh, stop expanding and then actually shrink and we collapse into um, a big crunch. What is now clear is that in fact, a few billion years ago, the expansion of the universe started increasing and that is put down to dark energy and we are now looking at accelerated expansion. That's another talk in its own right. So coming on to the why does the observatory look, it, look the way it does and as usual it's the science goals that drive the design. As I said size matters for a telescope. Initially at the very beginning, they wanted an eight meter diameter primary mirror. Now, this is and still is a bigger diameter than any rocket fairing and a foldable primary mirror was therefore needed. And that's a major technology challenge in its own right. The goal was to look further back in space and time than Hubble, but you cannot do this in visible light. Now, Hubble is essentially a telescope that has detectors that work in the ultraviolet, the visible, and a tiny bit of the infrared, very near infrared. But over the time the universe has been expanding since the first stars formed, effectively you stretch the fabric of space time. So the wavelength of light has been stretched and the peak wavelengths, the peak energy of the first stars would have been in the ultraviolet and the, the visible. By now, as that light gets to us, it is no longer ultraviolet and visible, it's infrared. So if you want to see the first stars, 
you have got to be an infrared observatory and therefore you've got to be in space because most infrared radiation is absorbed by the, uh, the water in the Earth's atmosphere and ground-based telescopes just do not work. So just by looking at the early goals, we know we've got to be in space, we know we've got to be infrared and to try and get this stuff we've got to be really big. But infrared, infrared radiation is essentially heat. So the infrared instruments must not detect themselves. The analogy is like an optical telescope made out of fluorescent tubes. You can't see any distant object. All you see is the light coming from the tubes. So to make infrared telescopes work, you have got to be incredibly cold down to this 40 Kelvin or colder. The initial goal was for a minimum of five years lifetime, a target of 10 years. Now, what that actually tells you is you cannot be in low Earth orbit like Hubble. In low Earth orbit, you are exposed to the heat from the planet. And the planet is essentially a ball at about 300 Kelvin or room temperature, if you like. Um, and if you have an infrared observatory uh, orbiting the Earth in low Earth orbit like Hubble, it is going to have an enormous thermal input. Now, small observatories have managed to be there, but you have to carry coolant um, and that constantly boils off and limits the lifetime. And frankly, the amount of coolant you would need for something the size of James Webb for a 10 year lifetime would mean it's just impossible to launch it. Um, I'm not even sure you could close the, the uh, calculations. Therefore, you've got to operate well away from the Earth and you need to shield that observatory from the heat radiation from the sun and the earth and the moon, because they will all radiate into space significant amounts. Obviously the sun is the major one. So how do you get super cold temperatures? There's a quasi gravitationally stable sun orbiting location where if you put a spacecraft, it can be exposed to the natural deep freeze of space. Deep space is a temperature of about three Kelvin or minus two centi Celsius, which is the afterglow of the Big Bang uh, from the cosmic microwave background. And in fact, this point is known as the second Lagrange point or L2. It's about four times further from the Earth and the moon in the direction away from the sun. And although there's actually a, a, a mathematical point, putting a spacecraft there, there means you can put in an, in an enormous volume of space. Several spacecraft are already there and many more are going, but that's not going to be a problem. Out there, you can passively cool the telescope and instruments down to 40 Kelvin if you let them stare at deep space, provided you can shield those bits from the direct thermal radiation from the sun, earth and moon. You must also thermally isolate the spacecraft bus, the box that controls the telescope and instruments, um, which operates at about room temperature. Uh, uh, but you've also got to make sure you thermally isolate as far as possible uh, from that. And to achieve the first requirement, um, we need a sun shield. It turns out to be a five layer figure as a parasol but it is literally the size of a tennis court but that's been squashed into a bit of a diamond. Uh, it's equivalent to a sun cream with a sun protection factor of about 1.2 million aboard an astronomer worked out on a, a test shift. And it's also got to fold up to fit inside the rocket for launch. So there's enough words there. This is very diagrammatic, not to scale. The white um, bit in the middle is the sun. For any orbiting arrangement, there are five Lagrange points, um, but the one that interests us is L2, the other side of the Earth from the Sun. And what happens there, and this is very definitely not to scale, is the Earth is orbiting the Sun. We all orbit once a year. Uh, the Moon is orbiting the Earth. Um, but then out at L2, if you put a spacecraft there, because of the way the, the, the mathematics of the, the gravitational uh, forces work, you can actually have a spacecraft that is almost stable there and it will track around the sun at the same rate as the Earth, uh, needing very little fuel uh, to keep it there. What that means is 
A big sun shield will always keep the sun, the earth and the moon shielded behind it. And um, you've got a constant communication distance. Uh, it makes operations a lot simpler. And that's why L2 is such an interesting place to go. So the next thing, having got the design constraint, was to turn it into real hardware. And it was very soon clear that an eight meter diameter was simply too big and too expensive, even for NASA. It was realized if the primary mirror di diameter was reduced to six and a half meters, there was not a lot of compromise on the science goals. But nevertheless, you still need a folding and segment segmented mirror design. Uh, and it's important to realize that there are 18 hexagonal segments make up the primary mirror, but they do not operate separately. They have to be aligned to make a single large mirror with one focus. Uh, and, and therefore, you've got an enormous challenge lining all these things up. But not only that, to make this whole project work, it was baselined with 10 simultaneous major technology development programs, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, the mirrors, the sun shield and the instruments were the most significant, but there were several other technology areas that basically had to be developed from scratch. So this was extremely ambitious and it's one of the reasons it's taken so long. The other thing is it was very clear the observatory would not be serviceable in operation like the Hubble. And it was not going to look like any other space telescope flown before. You simply cannot have a tube uh, around the telescope, like a conventional telescope, at the size of this thing, and it'd have to fold for launch. Uh, and what that means is stray light becomes an enormous challenge. I'll say no more about that, but that's a big issue for the uh, the optical engineers. And furthermore, it was known, it was realised we'd have to have an international project to spread the cost and encompass the best expertise available. And it's probably a little known fact that in fact, it was Europe that paved the way on infrared space astronomy and Europe has an enormous uh, heritage and wealth of knowledge in infrared space astronomy. So moving on uh, to the whole system, um, we talk about the telescope or the observatory or the spacecraft, and that's all loose terms for the thing in the middle of this, the JWST observatory. But we need something to launch it. In that case, it's the Ariane 5, and you have to operate it. The only thing that comes back from James Webb is data, and therefore uh, you need the deep space network, that's the NASA and also the ESA's network supports, and it's operated for what's known as the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where Hubble is controlled from. And it's tremendous benefit that People working on Hubble are also going to be working on James Webb, and so there's enormous uh, benefit there from um, the, the crossover. This is a diagram of the observatory, but uh, I think it's quick if we just go on and, and say you should think of this, any telescope, any observatory, there's always three elements. First of all, you need a telescope, a system of mirrors that gather and direct the light onto the instruments. You then have a set of instruments. They take the images, they take the light from that, the, the telescope, take images or analyze the light in, in spectroscopy, uh, spec, spectroscopy, and then you turn all that, the images and the, the, the spectroscopic analysis into data and send it to the spacecraft bus. And the spacecraft box, bus is the box that basically controls it. So that provides the observatory with the power the pointing, the propulsion, the thermal control, the data handling and the communication with Earth. And these are separate bits of James Webb you've got here, except the sun shield, which would be too big to show. But the crucial thing is it is no good having two of these without the other one. A telescope by itself is useless without the instruments to, to do something with the light the telescope gathers. And unless you get the data back and you can point it stably and do all the things you want to do, you can't have, um, uh, you, you, don't, you don't get any data from it. So you need all these three bits to make it work. And this is a, another diagram of the bits together. The colors are completely artificial. If we look at the picture on the left, 
The primary mirror is the 18 gold um, coated hexagonal uh, segments. Light comes in from the left, is reflected off the primary up to the secondary and then down through that hole in the middle uh, with the black tube there. And it goes through to the instruments that are mounted on the back. If you look at the right hand side, the thing that's called ISIM stands for the Integrated Science Instrument Module. And, and that's where the light is, is analysed. You've got the enormous sun shield, five separate layers, and then you can see the spacecraft bus on the right where the, the sun shield has been removed. The other thing to note is the red tube. Um, and for launch, that is a, a telescoping tube that basically collapses the bus and the observatory instruments together and then extends once uh, in orbit. Um, and that gives you more thermal isolation and gives room to spread out the sun shield. Don't expect you to read all this, but just to say it's big, it's over 21 metres one way, nearly 15 metres the other way. The stowed configuration is best for to be 11 metres. It's over six tonne launch mass and it's got a two kilowatt solar array. Early in the project, NASA built a full scale mock up to try and get over, particularly to Congress and, and all the people funding this, just how big it, it really is. And, and that's a picture at the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center with some of the team. The other way to look at mirrors is the primary mirror size. As I said, that is the, uh, the, the, the classic way of looking at telescopes. Hubble, 2.4 meters in diameter. That is not the biggest space telescope. The European Herschel telescope, that was a far infrared telescope, launched some years ago and now uh, finished its active life. That was three and a half metres, but James Webb is six and a half and just gives you some feel for it. Uh, in terms of where we're looking, Hubble was looking into the ultraviolet, the visible and just into the near infrared. And Webb is basically looking from the edge of the visible right at the edge of the red through the, the near and mid infrared wave bands. Uh, for those interested in telescopes, it's a three mirror anastigmatic design. It provides a wide field of view that cancels out the three classic aberrations. It's a F20 telescope. The focal length is 131.4 meters. And its resolution at a, a two micron wavelength is 0.1 arc seconds, which means you could differentiate a, um, a one cent or a, a, an English 1p coin uh, at a distance of 40 kilometers. And thermally, the telescope is capable, or well, the instruments are capable of detecting a B at the moon's distance. I'm always nervous when I say that because people have said to me afterwards, how many bees are on the moon? And that's not what it means, I'm sure you understand. So here are the takeaway points. James Webb is so scientifically powerful and able to address the key outstanding questions, it will transform astrophysics and cosmology. It's a very bold claim, and I think we're on the verge of actually proving it's going to do that. It's still fingers crossed time. It will be the premier observatory for the next decade. It will serve thousands of astronomers worldwide and it will complement the new generation of massive ground based optical and radio telescopes. It's a very exciting time to be an astronomer or a cosmologist. But it is, I think the easiest words to describe it are technically audacious. I talked about the 10 simultaneous development programs, which was pretty risky. But there are over 200 release and deployment devices, 155 motors, 344 single point failures on the whole observatory. Uh, single point failures are things where you cannot have a backup and engineers and, and um, uh, scientists do not like having single point failures because it's what it says. If anything goes wrong there, that's it. You've lost the mission. To give you some idea of just how big 344 is, they only needed about only had about 90 single point failures for landing the, the rovers on Mars. So we're over three times that. Incredibly risky and it does not come cheap. When it started, the lifetime cost to NASA alone was about a billion dollars. 
Now, that is the cost from the very first studies all the way through design, develop, build, test, launch, commission, operate and decommission. That has gone from the beginning from 1 billion to 10 billion. Uh, NASA, there is no doubt they lost control of the, the project in terms of schedule and cost on a couple of occasions. Uh, and there's a whole story could be told there. There's at least uh, 0.7 billion euros for, come from the European Space Agency. There are other national European contributions on top of the ESA contribution. And there's the Canadian national contribution. So we are probably pushing by the end of the project about $12 billion. However, we are looking back over 13 billion light years. So that's less than $1 per light year of looking back in space and time. So I would say that's a bargain. And to give you some other context, uh, the NASA Artemis return to the moon program, the mission cost of the Artemis program just through fiscal year 2025 is expected to reach $93 billion. And if that's what they're expecting, I think I can guarantee the actuals will be more than that. And that is not a lifetime cost. So 10 or $12 billion is an awful lot of money, but you need to look at it in, in the broader uh, picture. So let's have a few pictures. Here is the observatory finally finished and folded up at the prime contractor, Northrop Grumman in California. And you can see the guys in the bunny suits to give you some idea of scale. This was the full five layer flight sun shield uh, stretched out uh, for, for testing. Again, from the people, you've got some idea of just how big this thing is. And the sun shield is absolutely key to cold operation. If we cannot get the telescope cold, um, basically the science will not work. We're looking to receive very faint heat signals from distant objects. Once it's in space, one side of the sun shield will always face the Earth, Sun and Moon and reflect light and background heat. And it's likely to reach around about 110 Celsius on that surface. But the side facing the telescope and instruments and therefore looking at deep space will have uh, a minimum temperature of something like 36 Kelvin. The outermost layer of the sun shield is only 50 microns thick and the other four layers are only 25 microns thick. This is basically a luminized uh, mylar type material. So imagine handling cling film sheets the size of a tennis court. And how you test that in 1G Earth gravity, uh, it's a nightmare. The folding process was highly complex. There were all sorts of components, tensioning cables, pulley assemblies, got to be stowed in a specific manner to make sure it deploys smoothly. And you can never test it in zero G on Earth. So it's not surprising this was one of the most challenging developments and this caused some of the significant delays. And just to show very, very crudely what happens here, the purple lines represent the sun shield, five layers. The sun comes in, heat hits the outer layer, warms it up, that radiates heat in, into the space between it and the next layer. But the design is such that we can bounce, effectively bounce the radiation out. And then this is repeated every time until you get to the cold side. This is the instrument suite. Instruments never look very sexy, but they are the heart of any, any telescope, but gives you some idea of scale. They're mounted on this big carbon fiber uh, uh, optical bench effectively. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on, on this and to show you what instruments look like. They don't look very uh, sexy. This is a block about a meter cube. This is mainly uh, aluminium. This is the mid infrared instrument that I was the project manager for. Uh, but inside those boxes are literally thousands of optical surfaces and the lump hanging between the carbon fibers legs you can see is the imager um, that, that came came from France. The mirrors, enormous time was taken to make sure the mirrors were OK. A lot of the optical engineers had worked on Hubble. They had been through the excoriating process of um, living with the initial Hubble anomalies. 
some of you may remember, and we knew we wouldn't be able to service it. So enormous efforts were, were made to um, make sure the mirrors were correct. So they are machined beryllium, uh, it is pocketed on the back, um, thin outer layer. On the back of each mirror segment is a set of motors and actuators, and you can adjust each mirror segment in seven degrees of freedom. So you can translate them in three axes, rotate about three axes, and you can actually flex very slightly and change the curvature of each mirror segment. So they were made, gold-coated, measured, very careful. Well, they were measured many times before they were gold-coated. Uh, they were put in a thermal vacuum chamber, taken down to very cold temperatures, uh, and were checked again at cold in vacuum. And the process was repeated again and again until we were happy. This is the main mirror being put together. The black shapes in the middle are actually covers over the gold mirror segments. But the point here is you can see the size of the jury structure for assembling the, the backing frame, the mirrors and the actuators, because the degree of precision was nanometer level required uh, when this whole thing is set up. This is the telescope with the primary and the secondary mirror there. If you look at the people in the white bunny suits again, you can see just how big the telescope is. That is the secondary mirror folded across the telescope as if for launch. The instruments were then mounted on the back of the telescope and that whole uh, mass of the telescope and instruments was put through vibration testing, acoustic testing, thermal testing. It was tested down in the, the Johnson Space Center in the giant chamber that the lunar uh, module landers were, were testing for Apollo. Um, and, and this is an enormous chamber. And that was a several months, 24-7, testing, including uh, working through a hurricane hitting Houston. And essentially, the, the cartoon on the left is the telescope is deployed inside the chamber. It's hung basically from the roof. The instruments are on the back and then simulators are at the top, shine light into the telescope. And uh, the whole thing is checked out. It works under vacuum at very cold temperatures. Here was the integrated observatory uh, as it starts to get folded up. The sun shield is still out. Now the sun shield is folded onto the two pallets. The telescope is folded back and the pallets are then closed up. And there we have the integrated observatory. So if people aren't familiar with where these places are, just to say, if you look at the black, the prime contractor Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles is where eventually the entire telescope was was tested again for the launch environment. It was then put on a barge, shipped down the west coast of Mexico, through the Panama Canal, through the Caribbean, and to the east of spaceport in Kourou in French Guiana for launch. Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, who were the 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 joint developers of MIRI with, with the European Consortium are in northern uh, Los Angeles at Pasadena. STSCI is the Space Telescope Science Institute where James Webb will be operated from at uh, Baltimore. Goddard Space Flight Center is Washington DC, which is where the project was primed from. And Johnson is in Houston, Texas, where the thermal testing was done. So let's have some quick pictures. Here's the European launch site, essentially the edge of the Ariane, uh, the edge of the Amazon jungle, and that's an Ariane 5 uh, in the middle. James Webb was put in a, a, a massive container, uh, hermetically sealed and un, in dry nitrogen. The whole thing came on a barge. It was unloaded in the clean room. Here it is being unpacked, being turned upright, while the telescope was being checked out. The Ariane 5 rocket was being prepared for launch. That's the core stage on the left and the upper stage on the right. A uh, bit of a diagram of the whole Ariane 5 arrangement with the, you can see the stowed observatory and it's a very, very tight fit. Uh, I won't dwell on this because um, the Ariane 5 job was done in just 27 minutes from liftoff to letting go of James Webb. It then took another 30 days before we get into orbit around L2. Here is the move to the launch pad. 
And this is Christmas Eve at the launch pad, Christmas Eve last year. And this is launch on Christmas Day. And as the NASA commentator said, and I don't know how long they spent working these words out, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. And so many things were crossed. And 27 minutes later, the telescope was tipped off the top of the Ariane 5 upper stage. And we assume this was the last image we'd have of James Webb. You're looking up at the bottom of the telescope there. The ring is the, is the feature with which it's clamped onto the top of the upper stage. In the bottom left, you're looking at the edge of the solar array panels uh, that were due to deploy about 30 minutes after separation. And of course, that's the Earth on the right. However, the Ariane 5 injection was incredibly accurate. Uh, very, very accurate. All the parameters were completely uh, nominal. And the deployment of the solar array, which is absolutely critical because until the array is out and generating electricity, we're living on batteries, uh, on board batteries. So no solar array, no mission. And it was all pre-programmed that once uh, everything checked out OK, the, the array would be deployed. As I said, the Ariane 5 injection was just perfect. And while we were watching, uh, this happened. So we got a Christmas Day bonus. I'm afraid this has got some hideous music, but hopefully you won't hear it. And ESA cleaned up the onboard video from the upper stage. And so this happened. You're looking here at the observatory fixed in the upper stage. If you keep looking at the lower left, you will see our Christmas Day bonus. So that was absolutely fantastic to see, uh, and we were on our way. But it was always known that from launch to being ready for science operation was going to take about six months. It took a month to get to L2, which is one and a half million kilometers from the Earth. And in that time, that half the time is needed to unfold the observatory from its stow configuration. And then the second half was needed to move each of the 18 primary mirror segments, they had to be motored slowly forward off their launch stops by stepper motors, which was incredibly tedious and slow process. There were 22 major events. In fact, NASA went back and I think partly to, to raise the ante, they, they declared actually it was 50 major events, but it depends how you do the counting. There were over 180 deployments uh, to fully unfold James Webb in these major events. And a really critical period took about 11 days. Now, you may remember when the Perseverance rover went onto Mars, NASA spoke about their seven minutes of terror. Well, seven minutes is for wimps. We had 11 days of nail biting, watching paint dry effectively uh, to see everything slowly unfold. 
The crucial thing was the solar array, which we saw, and then the communication for high gain antenna to come out. You then have to wait a bit while all the volatiles out gas from the spacecraft. Now it's in, in the vacuum of 11 day period. Once we got to L2, we then had to wait for everything, the telescope, the telescope instruments to cool down to these very cold operating temperatures. Then you've got to focus the mirrors, then we've got to calibrate the instruments. So that's why it took six months. Um, some of you may have seen the, 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 the video and it was, it was briefly done on the opening video, but this is a, a rapid run through of the two weeks after launch and the nominal deployment sequence. But this actually only took um, two weeks. So moving on to operations, as I said, um, uh, day 16 to 25 uh, after launch was moving these mirror segments forward. And they, uh, were, they did not make a single optical surface at this point. Um, but we had to wait for the detectors, the instruments to cool down enough that we could process the data coming in from those instruments to help align the 18 primary mirror segments to give us a single reflecting surface. Once the telescope was aligned, the instruments have to be checked out and calibrated before we can declare the observatory commissioned. And that's all got to be achieved remotely. There is no possibility of a human servicing mission, but there is a bit of an aside here, um, and I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, there was a mad directive from NASA headquarters to fit a grapple fixture uh, at one time, but I'll come back to that if anybody wants to ask a question. So where are we? Webb went into the initial so-called halo orbit around L2 on the 24th of January this year. It took a five minute thrust to burn, but we're on station. The telescope and the instruments have cooled pretty well to their operating temperatures. The average uh, mirror segment temperature is currently 42 Kelvin or minus 231 Celsius. The three near infrared instruments are between 36 and 39 Kelvin and the mid infrared instrument that has to be colder than the others and it has its own cooler to do this is down at six Kelvin. This is all as expected. The three month long process to align the, the primary mirror was completed at the end of April uh, and that they went through a whole process of moving the segments um, uh, to get a single star uh, it was a random star picked in the field of view. Um, we start out with 18 unfocused copies of this single star and then we move them into hexagonal formation, then stack the images. And that's been done. I'll show you some pictures. But the alignment of the telescope is exceptionally good. The fineness of detail that can be seen is as good as, as is physically possible for the size of the telescope. In other words, for those who know, we are at the diffraction limit, and that was the design goal to achieve diffraction limited uh, resolution. 
The four instruments are going through commissioning. That's expected to be complete in early July. And it has recently been announced that there will be a major press release um, in all countries simultaneously on the 12th of July, where the first images will be released. So just to give you some idea, uh, these are images taken of the, the first images when they looked at the star and each of the 18 mirror segments produced a blurry image. They could then move those mirror segments around with the motors, the seven degrees of freedom, and put them into an array and then uh, start lining them up and focusing them and stacking them to get a complete image. And it was then made progressively sharper. And this image was put out some weeks ago. The spikes are diffraction spikes, exactly what you expect from this star. But what the astronomers were excited about was in the background, and it's not focused, but you can already see distant galaxies and the amount of information that's already there before it's commissioned and completed is quite staggering. So what will we see and when will we see it? As I said, the first public release of full color images and the spectroscopic data from all four instruments will be via a major press event on the 12th of July. That will showcase the full science capabilities of Webb. Now, because they're infrared uh, images, they'll be in false color. But a lot of images are, are produced in false color. A lot of the Hubble pictures um, can, can be done in different colors. And there's a thing called the Hubble palette, a, a set of colors used for certain things. Um, but the images we're going to get from James Webb should look a lot fuller and denser than Hubble and be at least three times sharper at the same wavelength. Bearing in mind, Hubble doesn't go anywhere near the range of wavelengths that, that um, James Webb does. And to use a technical term, the ESA science director said these images should be mind blowing. We already have, have a hint of what's to come from the first engineering images of sharply focused stars in the field of view of each instrument. Um, and they do indeed demonstrate the telescope is fully aligned, in focus, and it is far, far better than any, any telescope that has gone before. So here's a, a kind of example. If we take Hubble images, some of you may recognize this, the famous pillars of creation. And you're looking at millions of light years at uh, the, the size of this image. It's huge. But this is a stellar nursery. This is where new stars are being born inside these thick clouds of dust and gas. And an optical image shows you that. But the little bit of near infrared that Hubble's got, uh, even just going a slight way into the infrared, you immediately start to see through the dust and you see an awful lot more. That's the same bit of sky in different wavelengths. And as I said, if we did that with James Webb at the same wavelength, you'd have something three times richer and denser. I mean, it's going to be mind blowing, as the man said. This gives you some idea of the evolution of infrared space telescopes. This is the same bit of sky, but going back in time, uh, one of the early infrared uh, telescopes on the left, where stars are just blobs, a later one, uh, but with a very small diameter mirror in the middle, and then what has been picked out with the mid infrared instrument on James Webb as an engineering image just recently. And you can again see just what a wealth of information this is going to generate. And this was the first engineering image released at the end of April. Um, and this is the field of view of all four instruments uh, and, and the uh, fine guidance sensor. Um, th this is what they saw, the same bit of sky effectively. Uh, and to a non-astronomer, this maybe just looks like a load of blobs, but it is a, a, a rich set of data. So how big an advance is Webb? Um, and I'm, I'm now on the last slide, I'm sure you'd be pleased to know. Um, uh, but I think it's worth repeating this. Webb is going to look at light that has never been detected by humans before. And that is really something quite staggering. This is light from the cosmic dawn about 13 and a half billion years ago. And it hasn't been detected by humans because first of all, we can't see infrared light on the surface of the earth, as I said earlier. 
And even the telescopes that have gone up before have not been big enough or powerful enough to grab this very faint light. So it is an enormous step forward. We will literally see our universe in a whole new light. And James Webb represents a pinnacle in certainly in mid infrared astronomy because to put together the resources that could significantly surpass what James Webb can do is basically unimaginable in the foreseeable future. So this is going to be a pinnacle for some time. And the observations that James Webb will make are going to serve astronomy for many decades to come. And it should make a unique contribution to human knowledge. And it's been my privilege to work on and contribute to such a monumental project. Thank you for listening. I hope you now understand what James Webb is, how it came to be and why it looks the way it does.